Hello again everyone and welcome to my next video. In today's episode I will be profiling for you a person that many of you who are regulars to this channel should already be somewhat familiar with. That person is Aryeh Ralbag and I will endeavor to show you today how Ralbag is just another one of many rabbinic gangsters who violate the Torah by twisting and reforming halacha, thereby creating a big chil Lashem. In a previous video titled Mendel Epstein, the notorious rabbinic gangster, I mentioned the fact that Ralbag was implicated along with other rabbinic gangsters in kidnapping and torture schemes that were intended to forcibly extort Gittin from Jewish husbands in contravention to Allah. Today, however, I hope to expand your knowledge about this person's malfeasance. Now, some of you may have heard of the Triangle K a kosher certification organization, or Hefsher, whose emblem appears on many mass market foods. Well, what you may not have known is that Triangle K's certifying rabbi is none other than, you guessed it, Aryeh Ralbag. Triangle K notoriously provides the Hefsher on the non glot meat of the Hebrew national brand. Now, most Orthodox Jews, including Aryeh Ralbag, himself, would never partake of any Hebrew national product. So the question is, why does Ralbag, who considers himself Haredi, allow his Ashgacha to be given to meat that he himself would never eat? How and why would he be involved with a subpar Ashgacha in the first place? The answer, of course, is that a rabbinic gangster is not interested in following the rules of the Torah and Halacha, but instead always follows the money. But this begs the follow-up question, which is, if no one in the Orthodox rabbinic world would allow a bag's meat into their mouth, why would they believe anything that comes out of his mouth? This question only gets bigger when you realize that Ralbag is also a moiser, which means an informer to the government and other Jews. Being the great Russia that he is, Rabag officially became a moiser by acting as a state witness in New Jersey federal court against his former buddies, Mendel Epstein, and his cohorts, which led to them getting locked up, and this after working together with them for so many years. So it is a big mystery why people are still relying on his gittin when the Shulchan Aruch states that anything a moiser says or does, including his shechita, is invalid. More than that, a moser is considered a goy for all, practice, all practical purposes. For example, any wine that he touches is rendered as forbidden to drink, unless it is mevushal. But if Robach can't be trusted for anything, that would obviously negate anything he certifies under Triangle K. But the hypocrisy of the rabbis in which they choose whom to support and when, all at their whim, is well known. The modern Orthodox rabbis, Howard Jachter and Herschel Schachter, know all about Mesira, as I demonstrate from articles linked below. And in the case of a Moser, we have established that such a person is shunned by Allah, and those that support him are culpable for the same sin. So the fact that the RCA, Herschel Schachter, and countless others, including the Israeli Rabbanut, all accept his Gittin, is pure hypocrisy of the highest order. He's considered to be a goy according to the Shulchan Aruch, and they would not partake of his Triangle K foods. So why do they accept his gittin as kosher, and why do they support him? The answer is that they run their business as a for-profit business enterprise instead of running a bezin as a rabbinic court that demands great moral ethics. It is no wonder that the Torah refers to rabbinic courts as Elohim. You see, Hashem himself attaches his name to honest rabbinic courts in order to emphasize the importance of meeting out correct and proper judgment in all cases. In the case of Ralbag, just the opposite is true. In a letter linked below, I demonstrate a case where a woman sued Ralbag in court for his accepting bribes from her husband in order to produce for him a heter mea rabbanan. I am not here to judge the merits of that case, 
But suffice it to say that even if the husband deserved to receive a het or mayor of Bonin, Rabag had no right to extract from him the exorbitant sum of thirty to fifty thousand dollars for something that should not have cost him even one penny. The main indication that we have a corrupt dying on our hands is when you realize that he's only after the money. But in order for me to paint a proper portrait of Robach for you and to explain what he is really all about, I need to provide to you the facts that I am most familiar with, and that is Robach's involvement in my own divorce case. But before I get into that, let us first discuss some specific halachic infractions that Rabag has committed. Also, if you like this content, please give a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. The positive feedback that I receive from you ensures that there will be much more of this to come. In my previous video titled Lana, Luna, and the Lunatics of the RCC, I stated that Avram Union from the RCC Bezin in Los Angeles was a hypocrite for invoking the prohibition of using secular courts in the Batsri divorce case, but ignored this Allah in my case, in that he allowed my wife to use the civil courts. In a similar vein, Rabag also warned a woman about the prohibition of using the secular courts. Not only that, he went even further and told her that if at a later date she wishes to appear in front of a Bezdin, then in that case her husband would not be obligated to come to that Bezdin. You can see the details of this in a letter that I have linked below. And indeed, some credit does go to Rabak for quoting this Shulchan Aruch, something that I myself did reference in my previous video and which I have again provided a link to. But Rabak only demonstrates his own wickedness just like some other Bezans do, in that he picks and chooses which victims he applies this undisputed halacha to. As far as I know, the prohibition of litigating a civil court does not differentiate between genders or age or geographic location or what synagogue one belongs to. Now getting back to my own case, we will see that Ralbag's web of deceit becomes even more convoluted. Not only has Rabbah committed Mesira, one of the worst sins in Allah, by testifying against Mendel Epstein and the others in the rabbinic kidnapping gang, but he further demonstrated no fear of God by actively getting involved in my case in the first place. You see, Arya Rabag is my wife's Lana's first cousin, so he was disqualified from taking part in the case due to his being her relative. And to add insult to injury, Lana was embroiled in civil litigation in violation of Allah, which, as we said, should have disqualified her from getting her case heard by a Bezdin. But all of a sudden, Rabag didn't care about that. Now, let us examine how Rabag got caught up in his own web of lies. Rabbi Ginsburg of blessed memory, one of the prominent judges in Rabag's Bezdin at the time, knew full well that his boss was going to commit an injustice towards me. He therefore was kind enough to call ahead and warn me about this chicanery. Furthermore, he even went so far as to issue me a letter in advance to the fact that, since I was compliant in Allah and Lana was not, that I was not obligated to come to a Bezin, especially because of the order of protection, otherwise known as gag order, that she took out on me. Moreover, he explicitly wrote in his letter that no serif should be placed upon me since I was in compliance with Allah. But all that did not stop Rabak to arrange a fraudulent serif against me, which I have linked for you below. Ironically, his serif signatories are the same criminals arrested by the FBI sting in 2013, such as Mendel Epstein, Jay Goldstein, and in a separate document, Shalom Shuchat, all of whom were implicated in the kidnapping and torture ring. One signatory was Yisrael Belsky, who happened to have also been my Rebbe from Yeshiva Torah Vidas, so you can just imagine my surprise when I saw his signature on the document. I called him up and asked him very respectfully how he could have affixed his signature to such a document without even knowing the facts. Rabbi Belsky answered me that Ralbach simply shoved a piece of paper in his hand for him to sign, 
and upon reading it, he thought that the name Kin referred to someone else. When I challenged him that Ralbag was my wife's first cousin and that he therefore was invalidated from judging the case, Yisrael Belsky immediately regretted signing that document, acknowledging my astuteness in pointing out this halacha. I called him later on two occasions on Erev Yom Kippur and also sent him a letter which I have linked below, asking him for a letter of retraction, but I never received one from him. So unfortunately, once again, we have a dying admitting a mistake, but then not taking any corrective action when it was clearly called for. This in turn leads to a Chilul Hashem, when people who look up to rabbis as their leaders are suddenly disappointed to find out that their rabbis have been violating the Torah repeatedly, a scenario that unfortunately repeats itself over and over. I have seen that when rabbis are approached and are informed of their errors, they typically give the appearance that they were not aware of certain facts, and yet they never seem to take any corrective action. And while it does pain me to bring up Yisrael Belsky's errors, especially since he has already gone on to the next world, my objective here is only to report the truth and uphold the Torah laws and that is irrespective of a person's position in this world. But the story with Wabag doesn't end there. After falsifying a serif against me, despite one of his chief Dayanim issuing a letter not to place a serif, he continued his crusade by asking the RCC Bezin to place another serif on me. And to top it all off, he perpetrated yet another fraudulent and cruel act by faxing an emergency letter to his relative in Israel, who happens to be none other than sitting chief rabbi David Lau, to stop the burial of my mother of blessed memory. The way Rabbah went about this is in his usual modus operandi of twisting the facts and the halacha in order to justify his evil means. You see, he fabricated a halacha about not burying a mother, which is something that is not quoted anywhere in the Paiskin. At the same time, he couldn't even remember his own lies. In his letter linked below, he quotes Rabbi Ginsberg as being the one who issued me a seruf, when in fact it was the very same Rabbi Ginsberg who came to my defense in the matter relating to the gag order. So to summarize, we have here Arya Rabag, whom we have demonstrated possesses possibly the worst character of all his fellow gangster rabbis. He runs a for-profit besmin called Agunas Haganavim, uh, excuse me, I mean Agudas HaRabbanim, which in the past has utilized certain rabbinic felons against whom he actually committed Mesira by testifying against them when it got to be too hot for him in the kitchen, thereby stabbing all of them in the back and sending them off to jail, even after working with them for so many years. All of that was just to save himself from some jail time that he would have received for his own involvement in some of those kidnappings. He acknowledges the prohibition of using secular courts, then relaxed this prohibition for his cousin Lana Ralbag Kin when he should have never involved himself in a matter relating to a cousin in the first place. He lied and falsified a letter about Rabbi Ginsburg, his chief dying, and made up a halacha about not burying a mother until her son gives a get, despite a get already having been deposited at a Besden in Muncie, New York. He extracts exorbitant fees to obtain a heter mayor abundant for a client. He runs a profitable organization called the Triangle K, which certifies meat as kosher, which Orthodox Jews would never partake of. And yet, in spite of it all, he's still being given the red carpet by his colleagues, who continue to accept his gittin, as well as by the members of his congregation of young Israel of Avenue K, who allow him to continue to be the rabbi, despite the serious implications of being a moister. But in the case of the rabbis, at least, they don't care because virtually all of the Bedans are just one big conglomerate of gangsters who cover for one another. For if you or I would commit Mesira, we would be long gone, having been expelled from our communities and shunned by the masses. But the gangster rabbis allow their colleagues to violate these serious sins as long as they remain part of their club. 
And one final note here. <clears throat> we have been hearing the Askanen uh, calling out for everyone to join the massive prayer for Shiduchim on Tu Be'av holiday. Did the Askanen ever stop and think that perhaps some of the blame for the Shidduch crisis lies at their own door? For is it not they themselves who have perpetrated the notion of myriad unrealistic expectations of these girls, such as their requirement to attend seminary in Israel, something that is not necessary or even affordable for many parents? The unrealistic expectation is that every girl should find a learning boy, when for many a religious working boy would be just fine. Or the shunning of a boy from a good family who harbors the wrong political opinions. And most of all, the fear of commitment to marriage that has come about due to the many divorces that are taking place, a byproduct of feminist beliefs coupled together with the omnipresent profit motive. One would think that it would be the rabbis who would be first in line to stem the great tide of divorce presently washing over the community like a tsunami. But sadly, having a consortium of gangster rabbis in a field such as divorce that is ripe for money-making is a recipe for disaster, as the grim orthodox divorce statistics now show. But it is simply not politically correct to go after rabbis, nor to make any mention about the corrupt practices of our bezins. Instead, all the focus always goes back on to the general populace. And in the same manner that the rabbis in Askanen ignore the directive from Tractate Shabbos, Daf 139a, which demands accountability from corrupt rabbis in regards to us being able to overcome the tragedy of the COVID-19 epidemic, it also has the same repercussions for the Shidduch crisis. But instead, we hear misleading advice to focus on tefillah, prayer, but nothing about tshuva, repentance. And by that I mean fixing what needs to be fixed. And that begins from the top down. We recently read in our story of Parshish Chazon, where the prophet Yeshaya was reporting on the status of rabbinic corruption at that time. He ends by stating, Tzion b'mishpat tipadeh v'shovea b'tzdaka. The prophet Yeshaya states that Tzion will be saved through justice and through tzedaka because we need both. Those that are preaching that adding tefillahs or adding tzedakah alone will bring salvation while ignoring fixing the corrupt business system are simply deluding themselves. In order to fix a pandemic, a shidduch crisis, or any other tragedy that befalls us, the prophet states clearly that it is a two-step process. First, we must foster a just judicial system by removing the corrupt judges. And second, we must give tzedakah. That is the only solution. If the prophecy of Yeshaya was accurate when it came to the destruction of the Beis Amigdash, the Holy Temple, we should have no doubt that it is also his prophecy that will bring about the redemption. Thank you for watching and see you all in the next video.